So my background is in, is in U.S. law, and in particular with in immigration law and immigrants' rights, and so, uh, and especially from a constitutional perspective. And so that's where I'm coming from. Um, and it, it's, it's long um, troubled me that, um, that there's so many disciplines in this field who actually don't talk to each other. And even if they gather together in conferences, they don't necessarily read each other's literature. And so um, I'm trying to really think about um, start with things I know in, for, in part one a little bit more than in where I end up um, in parts three and four. So that's just kind of a confession about where this is coming from. I'm just going to go fairly quickly through the, you know, it's, it's almost like the bullet points of this talk, um, more to, uh, you know, maybe remind you of what you didn't like about this paper than to actually convey its substance. Um, okay, the, the first part is really just about immigration law, civil rights. I mean, it's really uh, talking about how immigration laws kind of fit into a, a tradition of the civil rights tradition, and I think there's a reasons for that. I mean, the one, the one I think that's most obvious is the is the is the long history of discrimination in immigration law and citizenship law. Um, another, and and uh, I think a lot of what's happened is that to the extent that civil rights framings um, tend to focus on um, tend to, to assert rights based on some sense of belonging, seeking a rightful place in, 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 in a nation state like the United States, it assumes some national belonging and a lot of the history over the past couple generations has been to expand or to try to expand the group of people who can invoke civil rights. I mean, this, this is permanent residence, but also very importantly, the undocumented. Um, that's a historical explanation for why things have developed the way they are. There's, I think there's a more conceptual explanation that, or a philosophical explanation that's worth highlighting, and which is that I think that uh, a, lot of the, the a lot of the justifications for national borders in the first place are justifications that I would, you know, that I think are familiar from people like Michael Waltzer, that um, the justification is to do better than having a thousand petty fortresses and instead having a just society inside the borders. Um, and I think there's something about the invocation of civil rights by people who are undocumented, for example, uh, sort of resonates with this idea of if we're going to have borders, we need to justify them as, as, as zones of justice. And if we're going to have zones of justice, they must include the undocumented, and then we can feel good about national borders. So that's kind of um, an ethic that I think this has played into. Um, I'm just trying to be descriptive here of why this is, has happened. But the difficulty with this framing is that civil rights framework you know, assumes a border outside of which claims to national belonging are more attenuated. And that, I think that makes, um, especially with changing popula immigrant populations and changing sources of migration politics, makes the civil rights framing vulnerable to um, vulnerable when populations change and it's easier for people who are skeptical or hostile to immigrants to uh, uh, to um, propagate a narrative of outsider threat. Um, so I think one of the issues that's come up is that, you know, if we look back even like to 2014, 2015, um, the, the invocation of national security threats, the idea that immigrants would bring the Ebola virus, which actually was, a, I think, a big campaign issue in the 2014 midterms, um, you have, the, there's a vulnerability there in, 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 in dealing with sort of um, migration more generally, that is, a different way to say this is I think a lot of the framing is results from the fact that there's been a focus over the last generation on the undocumented in this country that's created a certain narrative, a different way of framing, and would it have been different had the migration politics in this country been different? I think it probably would have been. Um, so that's one theme, and the other theme that's come out of this in this part one is that uh, there's an emphasis on anti-subordination um, by race, uh, ethnicity, and religion. Um, and, but not necessarily uh, an emphasis on economic justice, which I'll come back to, but I think that's one of the costs of this in terms of coalition building the arguments that are made. Um, so the major takeaway here in part one is nation-centered justice has a broad appeal, um, but it might be ill-suited to arrival of a large um, non-resident, non-citizen population for whom the connection with the United States, it might be based on colonialism, it might be based on economic subordination, but not necessarily because they're in the country and living here. Uh, for a long period of time without status. Okay, that's part, um, that's part one. So then the question is, what else can we do? And I think that a lot of the move has been to resort to a different, the other main pillar of immigration law, which is refugee law, or main pillar of migration law, which is refugee law. And I think that there, the paper talks about there's a core distinction in migration law um, since World War II that's treated uh, refugees more generously. Um, 
it's in a sense a traditional counterpart to nation-centered systems of justice. And I think that the, the I think refugee protection arose as an exception to uh, uh, national sovereignty, but it's also as an exception. And in, in some ways, it was intended to preserve national sovereignty by creating only a narrow exception. Um, and so we have a refugee definition that's quite narrow uh, as compared to the vast flows of, of, of forced migrants around the world. Um, and of course, the reality is that um, migrants do not divide neatly into refugees and all others. Um, and so, so what happens? Um, so refugee law and immigration law are trying to do this work uh, of managing or responding to migration. And, uh, but refugee law, um, uh, I think, assumes that uh, it is an exception not just conceptually but also numerically. And so countries who um, obligated themselves under, in the Geneva Convention and, and other instruments to maintain refugee exceptionalism end up doing things to make sure that people can't apply for asylum. Uh, and, so, um, and, and so they include interdiction, third party, uh, uh, safe third party agreements, uh, and we've seen now in this country rules that you must apply at a port of entry, except we won't take your application at a port of entry, right? So, um, and so beyond that, um, um, so, so part two ends up arguing that um, refugee law gets essentially pulled back into the, into the, into the orbit, the political and the conceptual, uh, well, I mean, more the political orbit of, of um, national immigration law, uh, even if nominally and formally it may stay outside. And, and you have a lot of ad hoc responses, uh, re re restricted definitions, restrictive procedures, but a lot of ad hoc um, devices like temporary protected status that I think do the right thing in many instances, but it's a combat, but, but in fact are ad hoc and don't really add up to necessarily a coherent whole. You know, I would include efforts to uh, just sort of to push the boundaries of the refugee definition of special immigrant juvenile status, things like that as, as part of that response. And so, um, and so the question is really what is the, what is the alternative? I mean, what really fills the space? What could fill the space between uh, immigration law and refugee law besides ad hoc solutions. Um, one one semi-obvious arena is, is human rights. Um, and I think it's played more of a role in Europe uh, than it has in this country, but I want to you know, flag that as, as, a, as something that I could talk a lot more about um, but, um, than I do here but in this particular version. But, um, but, I, but, but that's the setup, right? The whole first part of the project is we have these two main pillars of migration law in this that's emerged from the circumstances, um, especially in this country, but not only in this country. I mean, there's a whole tension in this book about what I'm actually am I writing about. I mean, I want, I'm writing from a US perspective, but I'm also trying to say things in terms that are more generalized. Um, and so it's an open question. I mean, I'm hoping people, readers, readers around the world will say, well, that, that doesn't make any sense for my context, or other people might say, no, that's exactly the same thing. It'll depend. Um, so the, the first, you know, the, 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 first, uh, the first two parts of the book add up to saying um, the immigration law or the migration law as we've thought about things doesn't work. Um, it doesn't fit circumstances. It's conceptually um, inadequate and we're putting band-aids on everything so let's think about this more. And that's where um, I go to part three. Um, Okay, so, so part three really talks about, um, about where to go from here, and it starts, and, it, it, and the, 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 the bottom line in parts three and four is to think more broadly about how, we, how the law might, might engage with immigration, um, and, or with migration um, in general, and it starts with actually though a traditional legal question, which is what's the relationship between migration and citizenship? What's the relationship between temporary and permanent admissions? Um, what's the role of the undocumented in this? And um, so it, it, the, the, I mean, one issue here is, the, is, is a familiar set of debates about temporary admissions, right? I mean, some people think of temporary admissions as an important policy uh, tool, an important um, tool to sort of bridge um, otherwise unbridgeable gaps in policy making. Um, but and, and so you get the labor and then you don't necessarily um, get the citizens. But that, of course, has, has been severely criticized both with historical um, backup but also um, 
with um, you know, legitimate questions about the creation of an exploited underclass, um, which to tie this back to the justifications for borders, uh, all of a sudden starts to, un to undermine the justifications for borders. And so here I'm sort of rendering back what Walter talks about um, when, he, when he says that, um, and talks about the medics and, and, and the corruption of society by having a, a group of people who wanted for their work and not because they're really full members. Um, you know, but the other the flip side of that is if you protect, if you protect permanent, if you protect uh, temporary uh, uh, migrants or protect people who are not necessarily um, future citizens, um, if you protect them so much, then you're really, uh, you might as well be more forthright, honest, and transparent by talking about permanent admissions in the first place. Um, so how do you, how do you, how do you, how do you break that logjam, uh, both conceptually and politically? And so, um, you know, the main, um, the, then, then part three moves to talking about sort of, um, talks about the potential for international trade and development to, um, to make it possible to admit people uh, with a possibility of permanence, but with, with the creation of return options and circular migration options, which ultimately are going to be created much more by uh, development and the, and the development as a basis of security in sending countries and giving people choices, that's much more effective um, than unilateral um, destination country enforcement. Um, and so, uh, so this is where situations like the EU um, Turkey Agreement, the EU Jordan Agreement, and the negotiations with the United States between the United States and Mexico become um, something worth talking about. Now, I have to tell you that an earlier version of this of this paper was much more optimistic. Uh, it sort of said, "Oh, we have these things going on. Let's look at them and do the same thing." And I looked more closely at them and said, "No, we don't want to do these things." Uh, but and so and so. You know, at some point, th that point, the paper was going to end, uh, and I was going to work on something else. But, uh, but then I realized, you know, um, there is something to this. That, uh, are there ways that we can think about, uh, especially transit countries, differently? Um, and is there a way to um, avoid the problems that, have, um, that may be emerging between the United States and Mexico, um, problems associated with the EU Jordan Agreement, with the EU and Turkey? And so that's why then the paper shifted to, let's sort of try to be um, complete and analytical about the problems that we see emerging and try to isolate what they are. Um, so some people have asked me, where's the law in part three? Uh, what's the new migration law part of the law? And I, now I'm going to do something slightly unfair, which is tell you some things that are not in this draft, which I've thought about in the time and written up in the time since you've seen this draft. But uh, you know, I think that uh, the first question really is, is the role for law one of transparency, accountability, um, having a seat at the table. I mean, I think that, that, that that's, that's one thing that law can do, and lawyers are used to doing that. I mean, it's sort of like, it's sort of like if you have a problem, you appoint a committee. If, if you have a problem, um, lawyers will say, let's talk about the process. Uh, okay, so that's, that's one set of things that isn't being done now, and I think it would be, it's, it's certainly a role for law. But then the next question is, are there other standards? I mean, there's certain things that you have to insist upon if you have the transparency and accountability. And so, um, you know, and there's another open question about can human, can human rights play a role in that setting or what are the shortcomings in human rights? Uh, and, but that I, I have to admit, I have to uh, both acknowledge but also assert that that also involves not just the ideals of human rights, which is, um, you know, is, uh, but also what are the mechanisms for, for um, putting that into force. Um, and there's more I can say about that, but I'm going to try to keep this to time and, and, and you know, I, I didn't come here to hear myself talk. I want to hear what you have to say. So I'm going to try to blaze through this, this quick summary here. The main point, the takeaway of part three is that th thinking more broadly about migration and getting beyond the shortcomings of immigration law and refugee law as it emerged from the 20th century requires um, rethinking the relationship between permanent and temporary admissions, therefore rethinking the relationship between migration and citizenship. And that in turn requires uh, creating more options for migrants. Um, that requires looking for reasons for migration, which requires a holistic look at the reasons why people move, and that that's going to require greater reliance on trade and development initiatives, but that raises an incredible set of problems that the law has assumed has been, been beyond the, the competence of the law to deal with. So now I'm in this, in this zone of saying, well, we're not even used to thinking about this, as lawyers at least, as a, as a legal question to the extent that we might. And so it's uncharted territory, and the fact that it hasn't been um, 
as occupied by uh, legal standards and processes as it might be is not a reason um, to 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 uh, hold back. It's not a reason to 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 um, give up. Okay. So then, um, so just as um, part three talks about um, what causes migration, um, part four talks about what migration causes. Um, and in particular, it flips that holistic view and thinks about the effects of migration on uh, destination countries. And you know, here again, I focus on the United States, I hope, hopefully more as an example than as the outer boundary of the inquiry. Um, and this names sort of um, the economic arguments, um, arguments made uh, by uh, uh, certainly one school of economists on the harms in destination countries and, and starts to focus on that first um, as an economic question and try to identify and at least concede for the sake of discussion that there are people who um, may feel that they're the losers in uh, even if the economy is the whole benefits. In the same way that trade poses um, issues that at least seem to be similar. Um, and there's a lot of parallels between the resistance to international trade and the resist resistance to immigration, the, and, and, and um, both in substance and in politics. Um, and so one area here, this is another area where I think the law has not done a lot. And the question I'm trying to raise is whether it can do more, what would that more look like? Um, is to look at trade adjustment assistance policy over the last 50 years, starting with Eisenhower, going up through John F. Kennedy. Um, and, and I think a lot of what's going on there is a legitimate attempt to, to, to do right by the, the people who feel that they're losers, but it's also a political move to bring together or hold together a coalition in favor of international, uh, free, free, freeing up international trade. Um, and the question is, I mean, one, one question I ask myself, um, and you may have ask yourself is as you're listening to me or, or reading this that you know how much of this am I responding to politics how much am I responding to reality I think it's a tough question and I'm not sure totally what the right answer um, is I'll confess but um, but I think that the, the assertion I'm making here which is a more of a, a, a political consultant ass assertion is that unless we make an effort to take seriously the claims of people who've been displaced uh, we're opening up ground to people who use those arguments as a cover for racial prejudice and religious prejudice. Um, and the difficulty, though, is that I think that the most effective, um, the most effective programs for dealing with um, helping people who feel that they're on the losing end of this, of trade or, or migration, the, the, the most effective possibilities have been possibilities that reach rather deeply into uh, things like infrastructure, education. Um, they're not targeting a company and the, and the people who are laid off, but they're really thinking about the community in which those people live. And then, all, then I think there's a great deal of political resistance because resistance to that um, uh, because it starts to sound like socialism. Um, so there's that I want to acknowledge. Um, and so I'm looking for ways to take seriously, not just out of pol politics, because I think it's the right thing to do, to, to figure out exactly um, how to spread the gains from immigration throughout various sectors of the, um, of the um, destination countries. I think that, I think that um, there's a section in there talking about um, the uh, relationship of um, various parts of the African-American community and, 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 and sort of arguments, um, arguments sort of speaking in that voice on various aspects of immigration um, and how a lot of this depends on whether um, skepticism of, of immigration is articulated as a civil rights question or as an economic question. And I think there's a lot of intervention to be made. I think that intervention has been um, uh, forestalled um, by, and this is the full circle part of the paper, um, I think the actual, the civil rights framing by neglecting economic justice may have laid the groundwork for immigration racism by making um, it easier for people who um, are not just anxious about the economics, but actually more anxious about uh, demographic and cultural change and linguistic change. I think that the civil rights framing may have had the significant unintended consequence 
of seeding the ground of economic justice, which then allows economic justice to be used um, in ways that actually undercut the civil rights framing in the first place. Um, so um, I just hit 20, second, 20 minutes and two seconds. Uh, so this is, uh, and I was thinking about this, uh, yeah, this is kind of a crazy project in some ways, right? It sort of, it sort of looks like um, the research agenda that I will probably take the next 30 years to do. Uh, but it's really intended to be a roadmap. I mean, I think that especially as we get even into part two, definitely into part three, part four, I'm writing about things that I, th that I have been avoiding for a long time. I'm, I mean, this book uh, represents my confrontation with um, issues that are in part two, part three, part four that I've been avoiding, and I've always had the feeling like these are things I really need to talk about uh, because those are the things that really matter, not all the stuff that I've ever written about before. Uh, but it's also why I hope this is a good uh, discussion in this conference because I think that um, I can tell there are a lot of people in this room who know a lot more about different pieces of this. So my job is to just to just draw the map and hope that it, it, gets, it, it, it gets filled in by a lot of other people, including you. Um, so thanks. Um, just to talk a little bit about the first act. So, you know, I think just in general with this project, Hiroshi's really asking the right questions and providing some really interesting answers, um, or at least more questions that we can think about. So the first half looks of parts one and two look at what is the history of the use of civil rights as a frame for immigration and what are its limitations? And then how has the fact that we've split off refugees from immigrants um, affected refugee protection? Um, and so when I read this, what I really love is on page 16, he says, who belongs enough to invoke civil rights? And so I thought of this as being this really important question. So I took one law school class when I was in grad school. I took administrative law because if you do immigration, that's, that's where it goes. And the one thing I like really remember that besides Skidmore and Chevron, which I don't really remember what those cases are about, but I remember they were important, um, was this important question of the role of standing and what, who has standing? Um, so I think this first question, or this first half really sets up what, given the civil rights frame, who then gets standing um, to sue? So we can think about this as increasingly important um, around Trump the Trump administration. So, you know, this idea that we are sending um, refugee asylum seekers back to Mexico to be processed. Um, which violates, you know, the UNHCR set out, you know, on their daily briefing, which if you'd like to be depressed every morning, you should definitely get the UNHCR's daily briefing. Um, it said, you know, this is against international law, that what they're doing, but who has standing to sue? Um, and how about the parent of a legal permanent resident who's not allowed to come because of the Muslim ban to their child's wedding or graduation? So do they have sue, standing to sue? So I think just thinking about, you know, given this framing, who has standing? And the same thing with, he argues, with uh, the refugee regime. And so he argues that we need a broader definition and maybe more paths of entry beyond just this sort of standard Geneva Convention. So I think these are all really interesting questions. So I'm going to move on to talk a little bit more about part three, because it's one um, that sort of the topics are, are ones that I know better. So the question for part three is, taking this realization that many people who are migrants at least say when they, before they leave, I want to come back. I don't want to be a permanent migrant. I'm going for a while um, to go make more money to support my family or to get out of this terrible situation, but I want to go home. And how can we build a better immigration system that recognizes that many people do not want to migrate permanently, but that once they get to their destination, they might create ties in their new land um, where they are. That means that they do want to stay permanently. Um, and so Hiroshi's answer here is that maybe we should increase temporary admissions, but make sure there's some sort of path to permanent residence citizenship, and then make home better for those who want to migrate in the first place so that they, uh, maybe people won't want to migrate as much and that more people will want to return. So this question about making home better is something we've talked a lot, you know, in political science for a long time, especially when we think about foreign aid and the role of trade. Um, so first, just thinking about development aid, we're not even sure if this works, guys. Like, <laughs> we've spent a lot of money trying to develop um, countries, doing aid projects, um, increasingly trying to measure their effectiveness, 
but, but we still don't really know that aid is going to work. And it could just be the case, like, maybe we just haven't spent enough money on aid um, because everybody trots out, like, oh, the Marshall Plan or, like, look at rebuilding Japan and Germany. We spent a lot of money. But then you look at how much money we've spent in Afghanistan or Iraq and think about what a mess those two countries still are um, and how we haven't created, you know, we've been in Afghanistan for what now, almost 18 years. We've spent a huge amount of money and yet we're not very far from where we were when we invaded Afghanistan. Um, so we don't really know how to do this. A second issue that um, Michael Clemens, who's at the Center for Global Development and other economists have pointed out recently, is that in the short, we might have different short run and long run effects. So we could even think about what happened with NAFTA. So with NAFTA, NAFTA was tried out, okay, if we do NAFTA, Mexico will develop and they won't send in as many immigrants, which I think is maybe sort of true now. But if we think about it, especially in the 90s, there was huge disruptions to the economy of Mexico, especially the rural economy, that sent a lot of people then into the United States for work because they didn't have work otherwise. So you always have this short term, are we sort of unleashing the poverty trap by creating more development versus in the long term, will this actually stop flows? That doesn't mean we shouldn't do it, but we should be more cognizant of the fact that increasing aid might actually increase flows in the short run. Then there's a the question of if we, focus, if we don't massively increase the aid budget, um, and we're focusing aid on places with high migration, are we taking aid away from the places that need it most? So right now we have a lot of aid projects, both the United States and Europe, have a lot of aid projects targeted at Sub-Saharan Africa. And granted, especially Sub-Saharan Africans are especially going to Europe now, but they're not coming to the United States. So if the US was to shift our portfolio, we'd be shifting it to Central America and Latin America, which might not be a bad thing, not saying that those countries are great, um, or don't need our help, but we might then be taking it away from countries in Sub-Saharan Africa who maybe have a greater claim because they have more people who are living on less than a dollar a day and those sorts of questions. My other concern would be who gets the aid project. So if we're focusing it on people who might migrate, are we then spending more money on trying to keep young men and give young men opportunities within countries rather than spending it on women or children um, who maybe deserve it more, especially if we think about like historic injustices. So we need to think a little bit about whether or not this would lead to aid diversion. Then finally, one thing that I thought was interesting was that there was nothing about political development. It was all sort of focused on economic development. Um, and while maybe scholars of the 60s thought economic development, if countries just develop, they will democratize, we now know that development actually usually helps autocrats. Um, and doesn't particularly necessarily lead to political development. So we should think a little bit about the political development. And again, this might be short term versus long term. Short term, if we're supporting pro-democracy groups in various countries, that might actually destabilize the countries and lead to refugee flows in the short term, but might be really good in the long run. Um, a second thing that a uh, point that Hiroshi brings up is like, this idea that there needs to be more um, international agreements between states. And one concern that he has is that the, about the exploitation done in the name of the United States or in the EU uh, with these sorts of migrant agreements. So you can think about all of the abuses that are going on in detention centers in Libya right now that are basically being done in the name of the EU as the EU gives the Libyan government whatever that is, whatever warlords they're funding, uh, money to keep people from coming to Europe. So then, this is where I think we could get back to the law question is, you know, does he envision a world where people would be able to sue the US government for violation of human rights um, done in these sorts of projects? And here, this is something I don't know, but I, but I thought, you know, what happens with like when US soldiers um, who are based in foreign countries um, get into trouble. You know, there's, there's all sorts of fights about whether those soldiers get tried in national courts um, or through the military courts. But is there something that, you know, is there something in that sort of law that we could pull in of like how people could get redress? Um, or was there something that happened like when the US occupied Japan and Germany after World War II that again, we could think about pulling into allowing people to say, hey, these abuses are going down in this program and being able to sue. So in general, I'm sort of skeptical about um, international, the possibility of using international law and treaties. 
Um, but maybe we can find sort of skilled partnerships. Um, like again, Michael Clemens has argued should, be, should happen in this compact for global migration. So I like this idea, not surprising since I wrote a book on trade and migration, that um, to think about more about trade um, and how trade liberalization has worked and what has made it so successful. So here I think um, maybe this belongs in section three, maybe it belongs in section four, I'm not quite sure. Um, we could talk a little bit more about the institutions that have made trade liberalization very successful. So if you, for those of you who are not deep trade scholars, um, prior to the 1930s, what used to happen is the Republicans would come in to office, jack up tariffs to a really high rate, um, because that helped please their constituents who were manufacturers who were not internationally competitive. And then the Democrats would come in and drop the rates back down because they tended to represent agriculture that was really internationally competitive. So you had this ping pong. And so what the Democrats did in 1934 is say, we're going to move tariffs away from having it just done by Congress, even though Congress still has the authority under the Constitution to do it, and instead move it to the president in hopes that um, the president has more of the sense of the national interest in mind. It also can hide what industries were on the chopping block until the end. It had this reciprocal nature that we were only going to allow openness if other states allowed openness, which helped bring exporters in because exporters wanted a greater access to other markets. And it helped bring in the national security concerns, especially after World War II with communism. Lots of people thought we needed open trade to stabilize Europe and Japan so they wouldn't become communists. So that was one I institutional reform, was to move trade from Congress to the president, and then Congress would just vote up or down. The second one was, of course, the GATT, which became the WTO. And the, w the main pillars have been uh, uh, most favored nation, which basically said if you gave openness to one country, you had to give it to everybody else. National treatment, which says everybody's goods have to be treated the way your own country's goods are given, and market access. So I think we could apply some of these to migration. Um, in many ways, Congress has already informally abdicated migration to the president. The fact that there's been very limited congressional action since at least 96, but if you think even further back about like really doing immigration law has really not been since 1990. Um, and you can think about this, that in some ways it worked for liberalization to some extent under Obama with DACA and DAPA. It got the, these questions away from vulnerable Congress people, um, brought in sort of this national interest that we don't want these kids and these people to be undocumented forever. But just like trade, it relies on the president having good intentions. So just like President Trump has put up lots of tariffs um, and started trade wars that were probably bad for the national interest, we, we do, do, I don't think we want President Trump um, <laughs> uh, really um, doing as much as he wants to do on immigration. Um, and, and so instead, you know, if we are going to do some sort of abdication or um, institutional reform where we gave more um, authority to the president, I think we'd have to think that there be, needs to be many more safeguards in the system. Because it's one thing, you know, to some extent hurt businesses. Yes, that's people's livelihoods, but that's not people's lives. And so, you know, I think there would need to be more safeguards than even what we have in trade. We could also think about whether there should be a world migration organization and what this would look like. You know, Hiroshi already sort of talks about this in the sense of like national treatment in part 3A of the, um, where he talks about um, allowing people to be treated fairly and not become an underclass. Um, but then there's this question of like, should we have most favored nation treatment? So if we open the door to farm workers from El Salvador, should we have to open the door to farm workers everywhere? And then importantly, who would be the exporters in this analogy? Who would be the ones, what are the interests we can bring in, the pro-immigration interests that we can bring in? Um, and then I will quickly go through um, part four. Um, so here the contention is, even though migrants probably really don't hurt um, worker, U.S. workers, um, economically many think that they do, and trying to connect this to broader issues of economic justice, civil rights, and globalization. So in political science, there's been this long literature that goes back to John Gerard Ruggie on embedded liberalism. And the idea was that states were able to, after World War II, able to better open up their economies to globalization when they had larger safety nets. 
because that we know that opening up to global economies makes people's jobs more insecure and makes things a little bit um, more, uh, more uncertain. But having a broader safety net helped increase support for globalization and trade. So you still see this today where like people in Germany have way higher support of trade than people in the United States, um, in part because they have this much bigger social safety net. So if they lose their job to trade, they know they already have this retraining that Hiroshi was talking about. They already have that sort of infrastructure in place. So Hiroshi argues that the US is abandoned if we ever really had these principles. Um, and I think just to highlight, he mentioned quickly TAA, trade adjustment assistance. I think he should be a little clear about um, the problems with it up front and what we should have um, instead. He mentions a little bit about the effects of immigration on the treasury. He makes this point when he talks about jobs, that maybe it's not immigration per se, but it's the way our markets are structured, the fact that we have low unionization rates that are a problem, not the market. He would say with the Treasury, I think he can make the same point. It's not necessarily the fact that lots of immigrant kids are in some locations that make them a burden. It's the fact that we fund schools on local taxes, which is a problem for all sorts of reasons. But another one is this immigration reason, and that if we could do if we could basically trade money from the federal government more to deal with these local issues, I think that would, would solve that problem. And then finally, I think the most difficult question that we all get to is how do we do with the non, deal with the non-economic anxiety that immigration um, brings up? So it provokes, of course we know it provokes sentiment that's kind of only somewhat related to the economics. Um, but we have to think about today, increasingly we have two groups. You have, the one hand, the people who are nativists, who don't want immigration, who really care a lot about this issue, but they are an increasingly small minority. If you look at uh, Gallup trends over time, increasingly, especially younger people, are much more supportive of open borders, but I don't think they care as much of those who really want closed borders. So the question then is, how do we motivate that larger sentiment? Um, and here I think we could maybe draw on like, the gun control advocacy groups who've been fighting the NRA, again, a small group that has really extreme positions on the issue that don't align with the majority of Americans but care a lot versus the majority of Americans who want um, more gun control. So we can think about, this sort of ties back to Hiroshi's question of who belongs enough, but who belongs to enough to get us to care about them? So dreamers we think prob we care a lot about, but what about their parents? What about refugees are outside the country? What about just generally poor people? Can we get people to care? And Hiroshi suggests, suggests that by increasing economic justice, we might be able to get people to be less nativist, which I think is probably true. Um, Judy Goldstein and I looked at opinions on immigration during the Great Recession, and we found that people who suffered more economic anxiety became more nativist. So I think you know we could probably get a lot of people to move Stephen Miller, you're never going to get him to move, but he's a lost cause, and maybe we just shouldn't care about people like Stephen Miller. Um, I think that's a fair um, thing to think about. Um, and then I think uh, by invoking economic justice as a civil rights frame, getting back to the politics, which is what I know better, you know, we know that African Americans increasingly support immigration due to concerns over sort of linked fate or the fact that uh, discrimination against one group might lead to discrimination against all groups. Um, so if we offer minorities more economic justice in general, there might be even more support. And then I think you could finally end the conclusion um, with thinking about the two, going back to think about the two pillars of human rights. So of course human rights always had the civil and political pillar, but also the economic and social pillar. And if you think back to the civil rights, the African American civil rights movement of the 60s, after the Voting Rights Act and the Civil Rights Act, King and other leaders really moved towards economic and social justice, um, but were stymied at the time. In part, this was due to our American culture, that like, we're gonna pull ourselves up by our bootstraps. Maybe it's due to welfare chauvinism, like we don't wanna share with people of different groups. But, you know, I think perhaps this moment we're seeing increasing support for a larger welfare state, just like after the Great Depression. Um, economic justice is back to the fore. People are like, yeah, AOC's plan to tax those billionaires sounds like a great idea. So perhaps this is a moment in which we can push justice both for um, immigrants and for those who would like to migrate, but also push a more economic um, 
uh, uh, justice in general. I uh, wanted to thank Roger for including me uh, on this uh, panel. Uh, I am an emerging immigration scholar, so I really appreciate being a part of this uh, conference. I, I write on a bunch of different things, on legal professions, social movements, um, but uh, I feel like an emerging immigration scholar. So I, 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 it's a great privilege to, to be on this plenary panel. And I also have to say that it's, it's like so amazing for me to be able to comment on Hiroshi's work. Uh, he's one of my heroes in the legal academy. And uh, so uh, every time I look up at a faculty meeting and I see he's there or a, con or a conference or a panel, I just sort of thank my good fortune. Uh, I appreciate my good fortune for being in his proximity. Um, I, I want to do, uh, 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 I'm going to do, l let me tell you what I intend to do and try to do quickly and efficiently so that we can get to um, open discussion. So the first thing I can do is largely stipulate to sections one and two, parts one and two of Hiroshi's paper. Um, uh, uh, and, then, and then really uh, kind of retell sections three and four through a more critical lens that I hope uh, Hiroshi appreciates. Um, and then um, talk about what, finally talk about what I think is missing um, from this narrative or this set of narratives um, that um, partly has already existed and partly is a projection of the future, partly picking up on um, where Maggie just left off with regard to the promise uh, of, you know, uh, kind of abolitionist, democratic socialist, other, other kinds of approaches to um, foundational problems that I think we all should should pay some attention to and incorporate into our work. Okay, so um, with regard to um, I, you know when I when I when I when I read the paper, uh, it reminded me of a quote um, uh, Assad uh, Hader, who's the um, author of Mistaken Identity, which is a book about race and class in the age of Trump. He's also a PhD student at UC Santa Cruz. He says this. He says. Against the claim of the nation state that there is an immigration problem, the response is that the country consists of everyone who lives there and works there, and there is no such thing as an immigration problem. Right? And if we start with, with that as, as an approach, then that leads us to different places than if we accept the assumptions um, that, again, there's an immigration problem. Now, Hiroshi does a great job in parts one and two problematizing um, the civil rights approach and the refugee approach. So civil rights and refugee protection problematize migration and generate responses that may be tactically significant, but that ultimately remain inadequate um, as a match for the larger social, political, and natural uh, climate change upheavals that we confront. Um, and, I, and I completely accept those sections, and I think it's a strong critique of what we have now. Um, and I'm on the edge of my seat. You know, at the end of, of part one of the civil rights section, Hiroshi says, asks, what is lost when responses to migration choose from a civil rights framework for non-citizens with direct ties to a national community and a refugee protection scheme for everyone else? I'm on the edge of my seat. I'm like, tell me, Hiroshi, tell me, like, what, what, what is lost, right? And I, and I read section two uh, focused on refugee protection. Although Hiroshi does not frame it this way, these first two parts read to me as a strong critique of liberal nationalism. The idea that, you know, Hiroshi talks about, um, uh, referring, referring to Michael Walzer, the idea that hardened borders facilitate equality and dignity for all within those borders. And we clearly see that the promise of liberal nationalism is undermined uh, in the current moment by the state and polity and over decades. So, the problem then I see um, in the paper is that Hiroshi doubles down on the assumptions and programmatic goals of liberal nationalism. A recommitment to assure that the sovereign polity is preserved and that the politics of immigration are altered and that immigrant incorporation kind of continues in the style of the way it has been with some, with some alterations, some creative additions. Okay, so I'm going to shift and talk about like what his, Hiroshi's responses to the breakdown of the liberal nationalist order within the United States with regard to migration, what his prescriptions are, and again, I'm going to be fairly critical here. So part three talks about trade and development. Um, I'm not an expert like Maggie is, um, but I have a lot of opinions, so I'm going to share those with you. Um, so, um, uh, you know, um, uh, uh, Hiroshi starts with some assumptions that I think are really, really important. One is that law has been absent in trade and development frameworks and policy. And I would say I'm not sure about that, that it's been absent. It seems to me that law has been important in 
a black box immune from public contestation, right? That's, that's the story of, story of trade and development in the last half century, the story of neoliberalism and the spread of neoliberalism and a, a global economic regime that's largely unaccountable to uh, popular movements to, and to national politics. Second, um, I think a more important thing to notice here is that migration has been absent, right? In Quint Slobodian's History of Neoliberalism, The Globalists, he discusses both first the half century long effort to place global economic activities outside of national politics and second the lack of attention to uh, the movement of migrants until national security imperatives following World War II and then again in the 9-11 you know, era, post 9-11 era, justify hardened borders. And so the, the economic elites are content to harden borders and that in some ways serves their agenda of um, cheapening the price of labor within those borders as well. So if we understand that the extant trade and development frameworks are foundationally inadequate, you know, I think that that imperils this, the entire project in this part. Some of the things that um, Hiroshi um, sets forth seem quite problematic to me. So for the, the idea of strengthening the transit countries like Mexico for the United States or Jordan for Europe um, in relation to Syrian refugees have been strongly criticized. So. Um, uh, uh, our colleague Tendai Achiume at the law school has written a book called Migration is, Col uh, uh, Migration is Decolonization and in it she has a strong critique of the negotiations between the EU and the uh, African Organization of States. Uh, she calls it an African containment plan basically. Um, and similarly, um, Jennifer Gordon just wrote a piece last week I think in Foreign Affairs or Foreign Policy that talks about the Jordanian failure which Hiroshi talks about, discusses in the paper. That is, an, but her analysis of why that program failed, the idea that the EU would extend development aid to create jobs in Jordan for Syrian refugees, is that the jobs that were created were crap jobs, right? They're the kind of jobs that are created in free trade zones in places like Jamaica and Haiti and other kind of parts of the periphery of first world countries um, that are meant to keep people where they are, but really aren't just don't fit the population and really don't speak to people's aspirations. Okay, so that's that's one kind of issue I take with this idea of transferring uh, of, of, of sort of putting lots of effort into strengthening um, economic development and containing migrants from from third third countries in the second countries that are in proximity to the first world. Second, he talks about increasing tra transparency and accountability, and here I would argue that this is a more utopian aspiration than socialism, <laughs> you know, in my opinion. Uh, for this, partly for the reason that I just talked about, in the, the sense, you know, uh, Slobodian and others talk about trade and development as, again, largely being immune from public contestation. I think to suggest that we can make an intervention uh, as lawyers or advocates or popular movements and alter the extant frameworks seems, again, to be a huge leap. And I think we're actually closer. We, there, there are less utopian possibilities that would uh, achieve some of, the, some of Hiroshi's uh, ends. The third thing he talks about is temporary, iterative, um, and permanent citizenship, citizenship. So different forms, different ways in which for people to enter and exit um, the countries, to the, the destination countries. And here I just, I, a word of caution. Um, he cites the 2013 Comprehensive Immigration Reform Bill, um, I think Senate Bill 744, which had a long, arduous path from uh, undocumented status to full U.S. citizenship. And people like Munir Ahmed and other commentators have characterized that path as narrow, surveilled and policed, contingent, um, and basically set up to create, uh, again, uh, to, to preserve uh, a second or third class of quasi-citizens in the country uh, for a lengthy period of time. Ultim you know, I, I appreciate Hiroshi's project to uh, challenge the assumptions of citizenship and to create more permeability of the national polity to different kinds of participation, particularly temporary participation at the choice of the migrants themselves. Um, but I would say that, um, you know, unfortunately, uh, things regress in, in, in policy implementation in, w under the current assumptions that we operate under, and I would argue under liberal nationalism. Um, he, you know, Hiroshi has an internal critique um, and, and, and shares that, as, as, as one would expect that he would have. That is, the idea that we're extending neocolonialism. He says, 
Um, these such schemes might shift power to unsavory character, uh, actors, sidestep the rights of migrants, erect new barriers to migration, undermine equal treatment of migrants. Um, and I say yes, yes, yes to all of that. Um, and, and then he, you know, uh, Hiroshi also says, in spite of this, these, these development aid, or perhaps to undercut development aid, politicians may remain fixated on enforcement-based responses. And I think when we talk again about race and racism, you'll see why that's the case and how a kind of economic development path outside, out of our migration problem I don't think is a very plausible one because of the underlying assumptions, again, of the, of the political actors that are involved. Um, finally, he says, migration is not a full accounting for all past wrongs. And I would say here, in solidarity with my colleague, uh, uh, Tendai Achume, why not? Um, wh why can't we think of um, migration policy as being uh, reparative or, in, in her words, remedial, um, short of, re of reparations, but at least at the least reparative? Um, and I'll speak more about kind of a more aspirational um, sense, which is very um, inchoate for me, but I'd like to explore a little bit. Uh, let me quickly go through part four, um, economic justice. Um, so um, uh, Hiroshi starts with some assumptions um, from kind of from the political consultant class, which he talks about, you know, in which he just talked about. First is that economic anxieties undermine civic solidarity. Immigration is one of many causes of unemployment and wage stagnation for U.S. workers. There's a perceived dilution of government services because immigrants are using those services, undocumented particularly, and LPRs. Um, and that there are tensions between African American communities and immigrant communities because of the competition for jobs in the low in the low wage sector or low skill sector. Um, and then he has this sentence: politically pragmatic responses start by assuming that these concerns have substance, then examine available options to see what they require. And he, and Hiroshi repeated that. You know, he talked about kind of looking at things from a political consultant lens. But to be honest, when I read it, my heart fell. You know, when I read that because. It, you know, if if we accept uh, these assumptions, some of which are have been proven to be empirically false, you know, uh, absolutely empirically false, then uh, we go on a path that takes us away from where we need to go. That really leads us into a sort of cul-de-sac or a dead end. Um, um, you know, he he does he does kind of have caveats. He says that. Um, nativism, that we've had nativism in spite of relative prosperity. So this relationship between um, uh, racism um, or economic anxiety and nativism is not always um, in place, that there are times when there's prosperity but there's still nativism. And he also talks about, refers to 9-11 as being na the national security imperative as like, you know, kind of over arching as a framework over time um, that um, obscures economic anxieties as the cause for nativism and creates a separate independent grounds for nativism. Um, he suggests um, some, you know, potential solutions here. Um, you know, trade adjustment assistance um, to me is a kind of immigrant, uh, immigration adjustment assistance seems to me to be a non-starter in a system in a context in which austerity governs all, right? And that, that ultimately undermines trade adjustment uh, assistance as a, as, a, as a way in which to deal with the dislocations of free trade. And I would argue the same thing is destined to happen with any kind of immigration uh, adjustment assistance. Putting aside that that kind of framing exceeds to the idea that immigrants are somehow taking out more than they're putting in, which is just not empirically true. And so if we're going to design programs that reinforce the, the nativist messages that, you know, that seems counterproductive to me and problematic to me. Um, Hiroshi does say that workers have been shunted um, to non-unionized sectors with much lower wages, and that to me speaks to a different kind of economic justice ag agenda, which I'll speak about um, in, in, a, in a minute. Um, and he also talks about cuts to higher education, which again speaks to a different kind of agenda, uh, and kind of mentioned by Maggie um, at the end with regard to a broader economic justice agenda. He, he, he says, he quote, he quote, he says, but if very little is done and the absence of effort is easily interpreted as a sign of, uh, of indifference, and this is with regard to politicians and economic justice, I, I say exactly. That's the problem. That's the crisis of neoliberal um, capitalism, right, At this, in this moment. That is, people like, the, you know, the sort of the Clinton wing of the Democratic Party has done very little about foundational economic anxieties. Um, this is beyond and bigger than the migration issue, right? So what's, what, what, is, what do I think is missing in the account? Um, the story about social movements is, 
is 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 a is a just subtext um, in in the article or in the in the paper, um, and it's described as kind of anemic social movement alliances that are focused on racial and religious equality but blind to economic justice. Right? That's that's kind of the story that's being told. And anemic is my word, not not Hiroshi's word. Um, and I just I, I think that's descriptively incomplete. In the last 20 years, there have been um, uh, two threads of activism on the ground uh, amongst in, in sort of immigrant organizing uh, contexts. So first is raising labor standards and protecting collective action, very much an economic justice agenda on behalf of immigrants, uh, uh, immigrants and native workers, right? All workers in particular workplaces, a kind of almost universal approach to labor standards. And second is the degradation and, and abolishment of enforcement capacity, right? So with regard to the first, raising labor standards and protecting collective action, groups like the National Day Labor Organizing Network, the National Domestic Workers Alliance, the Restaurant Opportunity Center, the National Guest Workers Alliance, the National Black Workers Center Network have allied with progressive unions in the AFL-CIO and the Change to Win coalitions. Uh, and they have agitated and organized and done direct actions for uh, higher labor standards. They've used litigation, legislation, policy. Fight for 15 basically comes out of a worker center methodology, an immigrant worker center methodology, and includes both immigrant and uh, people of other people, native people of color, African American workers in workplaces. It has been strikingly successful um, across the country. The second strand in this thread is the protection of collective action, the building of collective uh, countervailing power by workers. Um, and uh, I just spoke with J.J. Rosenbaum from the National Guest Workers Alliance for another project, and she said one of our foundational approaches in the work that we did on behalf of guest workers was that participation in organizing and campaign development would lead to status. So they fought for U visas on the basis of labor violations. They did concerted deportation defense. She said she did like 25 percent of you know, class action, you know, uh, participants' deportation defense, right? They were doing a class action to get back wages, and at the same time, JJ herself was representing, like, hundreds of workers, basically, in their deportation proceedings to save, stave off deportation. So it's that kind of commitment um, that, that has, that, um, you know, that tried to strengthen participation and countervailing power. Another thing, you know, that, that the organizing groups that I mentioned have backed is something called the Power Act. That is to expand anti-retaliation provisions. Um, it was introduced in 2015, um, and it's going to come back again in this Congress, and it's going to come back again in 2020 when it can get through. And the idea here, again, is to protect collective action. And these are, these are efforts that have been made by immig immigrants and immigrant worker centers um, working in collaboration with other, what, other organizations and formations. In terms of the other thread, degrading and abolishing enforcement capacity, the groups here are National Day Labor Organizing Network, again, they're, they're one of my favorites. Um, they spun off Not One More, which then eventually evolved into Mijente, which I'll talk about more in a few in a, in, in a like 30 seconds. Um, the Net New Orleans Worker Center for Racial and Economic Justice, um, the um, California Immigrant Youth Justice Alliance, National Immigrant uh, Youth Alliance. And basically, the story in the early 2000s was that mainstream immigrant rights groups refused to call SB 1070 in Arizona racist. They didn't. They were refused to use the term, you know, racism or Arpaio as racist, right? And so, the groups that Hiroshi argues are advancing the civil rights regime are actually the ones that are loath to bring race to the surface and it's these um, uh, kind of recessive groups that put race on uh, on the agenda but they do it in a really in a careful and interesting way not as an example of identity politics to use anti-discrimination provisions although they want to do that tactically to get some wins but they do it because they're trying to build a, a, a racial analysis that creates solidarities so they talk about criminalization across color lines. Um, again, not based in a, a fundamental belief in anti-discrimination laws and the efficacy of anti-discrimination laws, but in their strategic deployment to get certain ends that they need. The other thing worth mentioning here is that in the undocumented youth movement of the 2000s uh, that led to DACA and, and other, other wins, there was a great leadership of LGBTQ activists, so undocu uh, queer, you know, for example, that sort of um, across the country, in local, locally and nationally. And so there were intersectional um, uh, identitarian um, kind of a activists um, that were advancing um, uh, 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 the, the, the campaign to degrade and abolish enforcement capacity. Okay, so the larger issue here, it seems to me, is that 
there's movement ideation that needs to be taken into account by scholars, by all scholars, not just Hiroshi, but by all of us. Um, so Mi Gente, for example, has a policy platform. I mentioned it last time I was in this room, which is you know basically divest and reinvest, decriminalize internally, uh, demilitarize at the border, and uh, engage do strategic community reinvestment um, projects using that money that that you save from from those decriminalization demilitarization efforts. The idea here is to is that it's abolitionist, not civil rights. Right? Fight the school to prison pipeline, over policing, mass incarceration. And it's, yes, democratic socialist, not neoliberal trade and development. Um, the, the fight is against austerity and corporate welfare, right, the larger fight. Um, and the idea is to address economic anxiety without conceding that migration causes economic harm. Um, and again, how you define the problem determines the, the responses you're going to get and shapes the politics around an issue. And so the federal jobs guarantee free college for all, Medicare for all, the Green New Deal are universal programs that basically would fundamentally alter uh, the politics around migration. Um, you know, I have a quote from Cedric Robinson. I, I really want to read it, so I'm, I know I'm way over. But I mean, the, he basically says, the political consciousness of black labor, white labor, and immigrant labor were to be smothered by the social discipline implicit in the legends. Complemented by the terror of state militias, company police, and security agents, the persistent threats of immigration controls, the swelling tanks of reserve labor, racialism was reattired so that it might once again take its place among the inventory of labor disciplines. And he's writing about the post-bellum period in the United States, but he describes a set of conditions that appear to me to have persisted through the 20th century and into the 21st century. And so it seems to me incumbent on us as scholars to reckon with racial capitalism and settler colonialism. And we have to displace neoliberal programs with an inconsistent commitment to identity politics as a cover for policies that continue to concentrate wealth and power. I think what, you know, we need to, all of us need to take imaginative leaps of faith. We need to provide intellectual scaffold, scaffolding for more radical approaches to, to migration. Um, and we need to, if, if we ourselves are not converts, then we need, at least need to grapple with the challenge to the terms of the debate, right? And the liberal nationalist terms of the debate and we need to question our own programmatic um, assumptions. So, thanks. Yes, and we'll, we'll collect three questions, I guess, and then we'll uh, go to the front. Yeah, so I was wondering about your thoughts on how do states choose to define its territorial jurisdiction of their borders differently depending on the context for strategic purposes. For example, when states deny the extraterritorial application of human claim that refugees have not entered their territory and are not responsible for them, effectively rationalizing refugee pushback policies, for example, in the EU and in the US. At the same time, um, borders increasingly are, be are being increasingly expanded beyond the boundaries of the state. For example, the 100 mile uh, radius space that is considered a border zone. In this case, the interior checkpoints that do magnify inequalities in the interior of the US. So how, did the defini how does the definition of jurisdiction impact to what extent states adhere to civil and human rights um, and I also wanted to hear your thoughts about the contrast between prosecutorial discretion, which protects certain populations from being deported versus discretion exercise at the border aimed at detecting unlawful entrants and deporting them, and ultimately opens the opportunity for CBC to racially profile individuals. So do you think discretion is, in general is beneficial or problematic to civil rights and human rights protections given that only certain groups can benefit from prosecutorial discretion? Okay. Uh, yes, go ahead. Uh, I have questions. Uh, what is the, the general opinion among the, the panelists regarding the, the policies implemented by Mexican President Andrés Manuel López Obrador regarding uh, stopping uh, crime, uh, uh, promoting, promoting social justice? Uh, <coughs> to many other economic support programs. And uh, my second question is uh, regarding, I think, Maggie? Maggie uh, you mentioned, uh, you, you talked about the, the difference uh, between the Marshall Plan and NAFTA regarding uh, American investment in foreign countries. Uh, I. I'm not very versed in economics, but I read uh, a book by Eric Reiner regarding um, the, the, the differences between 
those systems were regarding uh, the implementation of uh, uh, stronger welfare protections instead of, of radical open open markets. Um, I was wondering uh, if you considered that perspective or or what could you add to that? Other questions, comments? All right. Why don't you respond, and then we can pick up on these. Uh... You mean? Uh, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, wow. Um, yeah, I mean, th this is these are great comments. I mean, they're really very fundamental. Um, and then I'll want to say something about that, sure, and then and I'll respond to these questions, and then see what more conversation we can have. Yeah, I mean, um, you know, I think a lot of academic work or writing or any any form of expression is kind of a exercise in multiple personality. <laughs> Right, and so I think as I was sort of, um, as I was listening to Maggie and Samir, I was thinking, yeah, um, I agree with a lot of this, even though it goes to the core of what I'm even, even doing this whole project. Um, and so I'm, then I'm trying to figure out, well, you know, what exactly is, 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 is going on there? Um, and, I, and by the way, I'm skipping over some things that I think where I, 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 especially when things get read back to me that I wrote, I realize, well, you know, I didn't quite mean that, but I can yeah. see why it could be read that way. But I'm going to skip over those things because <laughs> I don't think that most of the, I don't think most of the comments went to those things. Um, yeah, I mean, I think that, um, I think this whole project, um, and this is maybe true for a lot of migration scholarship, raises this question of the balance between um, the utopian and the realistic, um, that's one axis or one set of dimension, that's one dimension I'm really struggling with. Um, another is um, the question of how much does this amount to a critique of liberal nationalism? I mean, I, could, I think it's a very fair, fair reading of the whole paper. I mean, I could have easily written uh, a different end to part three and a different end to part four that was a complete teardown, you know, and that drew that conclusion. Um, and this is the, I, um, and so, and so what you're seeing here to some extent is um, this mixture which, you know, maybe I just can't help it, but it's the mixture of um, being, seeing facts on the ground and then wanting to think that there's a pony somewhere, <laughs> but in fact, you know, it's, there's really just a pile of, you know. <laughs> uh, you know, and, and, so, and so I realized that. I mean, it could have turned another way, and so it makes me realize it's one of those movies where you, the audience gets to choose the, the conclusion, and so I, that's, why, that's why I think you're, you're completely, I mean, both of you are quite right in suggesting that one could take these things in a very different way. Um, you could take it as a critique of global nationalism. You could take it as a, as a critique of the whole project of development as being um, so uh, freighted with so many other agendas that you'll never get anywhere. And so to some extent, I mean, there is an incorrigible optimism that may be kind of crazy. Um, now, um, let me step back from that. I mean, that's kind of a meta comment to the meta comment, but let me make a meta meta comment, which is that um, I'm trying to figure out what this place is, um, what the purpose of this whole project is. It's a roadmap, right? It's, it's supposed to be, I, I, there was a version when it was the compass, but this is really more of a roadmap. And um, I'm actually trying to create a framework for people to think about the work they're doing and to kind of position um, their work, whether it's in one discipline or another, or whether it's in one issue or another. I think the contribution of this project is to pull together many different questions that other people have talked about, um, but not, I think, thought enough about how it relates to other projects that other people are doing. And so, what I took away from your comments was to be more open about my concerns and not say, well, I have these concerns, but let's move on and talk about all the good stuff. I think, it's, I think I need to be much more forthright about how this could be a critique of liberal nationalism, that development may not work. But still, I would feel that I would give some bit of a traction map for people who argue for improvement in smaller scale. That's, that's sort of a, a reflection on what this project is about. Um, I, I, wanna, I, mean, I, can, I can go on about that, but I'm going to stop there on that meta level of, uh, um, of, of because I feel like that would inform any specific critiques, you know. Yeah, sure, the development, um, you know, it, uh, um, has these issues. Um, I do think that the time question is super important. I think that a lot of this is a question of how long you 
you know, what is the angle of the bending of the arc here? <laughs> is it almost a straight line or is, it, is there really an arc to it? And, and I think that's, but I want to identify, that's an example of something I want to identify for people to think about that hasn't been identified even. So in some sense, you know, I, I, one question I have is does it really matter if this is a tear down of national, real, liberal nationalism or not? Does it really matter um, if this is a critique of development or the role of the trade? Can, okay, so um, that's kind of a general thing. I'm going to stop on the met meta because there's just there's so much, and, I, and maybe that triggers more sort of interventions, or, you know, really f reflections um, stated or unstated on your own, everyone, everyone's work in this room. Um, so, but let me, let me, uh, let me um, um, respond, to Stefania, to your, to your questions, because I think that they, they, when I first, when you first expressed them, I thought they were very specific, and then I realized, no, this is actually raises these really fundamental issues that I think are really worth raising. I mean, I do think that the, all the border manipulation and jurisdiction, I mean, if, my first reaction, and I think this is a core of my answer, is that this is really the example of um, sort of nation states holding on to making sure the refugees are just an exception, that the Geneva Convention was just an exception, narrowly defined. I think there's a whole bodies of law that are about that. I mean, everything from remaining in Mexico to interdiction of Haitians uh, to, um, to really trying to limit the boundaries. I mean, the United States has has, has a history, of course, of, 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 of exercising power in domains where it, it, it doesn't accept the, the, the regulation of law, right? I mean, that's really what, what the spread of economic power, so, but, but restricted application of the Constitution. So I think your discretion point is, is, is similar to that because in the same way that there's manipulation outside in the areas I describe in trying to cabin refugee policy and refugee protection, make sure that not that, not that many people get it. Um, and that's really a lot of part two. Um, I think the same thing happens inside this country. I think that um, we create the law, but the law is really the exercise of discretion, but it's a lawless zone in the same way that outside the jurisdiction of the Constitution is a lawless zone. And so what happens really here um, in, in, I think, in, in immigration enforcement or immigration as is implemented is that uh, the law says one thing and enforcement is another. But it's not just enforcement, right? It's, it's, it's also which, which applications for naturalization get, get approved and which ones just languish on a, someone's desk for you know, months or even years. And so I think that, um, yeah, I mean, I think those are two, in some senses, um, examples of the problem I'm trying to describe. That said, <laughs> Um, I think that a lot of the, the, the pushback against those, the resistance against those, have been advocates have reached for kind of a, a uh, the most, the frame that makes the most um, sense. I mean, Samir, you put it nicely that there's just kind of like you reach for the tactical thing, but you're not really thinking in the larger. You, you, had, you had an elegant way to put it, which I'm going to get from you later. But, <laughs> but um, you know, and, that, and, and so, the, so in some sense, the lack of jurisdiction or the lack of the reach of the Constitution and the exercise of discretion are precisely the kind of things that are really tempting to attack in civil rights terms. And then you lose the bigger, um, <coughs> you, 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 uh, um, lose the, um, the bigger picture. So in that sense, those are good examples of, this is why I ended up talking in part one about um, DACA and in part two about uh, interdiction. Um, okay, so, so I feel I should defer to Maggie on the Marshall Plan versus <laughs> NAFTA question. Um, you know, I, but I, I do, I do want to, um, and defer to both of you on all this stuff, actually, but, um, and follow up on, um, but, but I, I, I do very much appreciate um, the, the short-term, long-term question, and that, of course, is a question of what's too much to hope for, what's too much to expect. Um, um, but I, can, I, I feel like you should take that on, cause especially because the question was directed to all of us. Um, yeah, so I think, you know, I definitely think there's something to that idea, and this and Samir's comments made me think about this more. Is the way in which, you know, post World War II and even post Great Depression, so even before we get to World War II, you had just seen this move from 19th century globalization, where like we didn't care about workers at all. Workers were just cogs in the wheel. There was no welfare state. There were no protections. So you start to see in the early 20th century increasing unionization, increasing protections in, for workers in Europe and in the United States. And then after World War II, when they were getting together at Bretton Woods and stuff, and they were saying, like, we're going to rebuild the global economy, but we're going to do it in a way that protects workers. We're going to try and protect workers. And so you have this 
Not so much in the United States, but in Europe, you have the, the creation of a giant welfare state, which might uh, help explain why the Marshall Plan was more successful um, in not creating as much dislocation. But there was still a fair amount of dislocation um, coming out. There's still a fair amount of people who left Europe in the years immediately after the war, not just displaced persons, but others as well. Um, but I definitely think, you know, by the after the crisis of stagflation in the 70s and this move to, well, like maybe the welfare state wasn't the right way to go. We need to go back to much more 19th century version of capitalism where we have fewer protections that creates economic dynamism. Um, and NAFTA was part of that. And I think hopefully what we're starting to see now, at least in the United States, is this move back to like, maybe we need to be somewhere in between. We need a larger welfare state, even though that might take away some amount of like the dynamic, you know, capitalism, creative destruction that's going on. Um, but, but you're not, you're actually not, what's funny is you're not seeing that quite as much in Europe yet, um, which you would have thought the opposite. Where in Europe, they're still like, we have to do austerity, even though like Greek unemployment is still at like the 20%. And which is crazy. And like Spanish youth unemployment is like close to 50%, which like that is this crazy. So I think, you know, Samir, I, I really liked your point about thinking about austerity. And especially in this world where like, like the economy has been booming for years now, if you look at like the stock market and economic growth, and yet we still have austerity in a lot of these programs. And, and this goes on like the ideas of like big things. I was like, I love this plan of like, that billionth dollar you have, let's tax that at a hundred percent. Like nobody should be a billionaire. I would even cut that back. Nobody should have like five hundred million dollars. That's ridiculous, you know. So, so I think that could be part of it, and gets at sort of this this comment. Um, and then Hiroshi, Stephanie's point that I just wanted to bring up to you, thinking about detention, is like if we're thinking about a roadmap and the civil rights framework, what is the how is the fact that like so much of immigration law is in a, the administrative state and not in like the regular legal framework a problem? And is that something that you want to address? Is that something we should be addressing? Because if you think about it, like the the no not having you know a right to a lawyer, not having the same safeguards, having you know administrative judges. Um, I have a friend who got all of the asylum data for like the last ten years, who shows that like. Yeah, it really is the case in El Paso that the judges are way worse and like are, are going to like knock your case down no matter what. Like, yeah, it helps if you have a lawyer, but even then your percentage isn't high versus in San Francisco. So like, is that something that you're thinking about? Because I think that seems so important to those of us who sit in a non-legal view of like, this is really weird that this just isn't part of like the regular legal framework. You want to say I mean, I have to say I want to hear more from people, uh, so I, I don't want to. I mean, I just quickly, in, re in reaction to that, I mean, I, um, I mean, there's like, there's the criminal legal system, there's, there's other, both Article Three and then state and local courts, and so, and I, you know, the way I think about them is like poor people's courts, housing court, um, and poor people's courts look the same, you know, across subject areas, and so that, that's what I fear about a, a big effort by lawyers or law professors or you know legal scholars to try to push kind of more formalization that um, it's all about political power that basically configures the 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 the, the structure um, but you know and that's kind of um, it's a little nihilist you know or whatever I mean you know and it, it, we need to be constructive um, there has to be some alternative to the to the to the status quo I, I'm just I, just I'm not sure that's it that's my opinion. Some questions. Yeah, a question, but not answered. Uh, oh. <laughs> yeah, but I'll you didn't get your answer. Oh, yeah, so the criminal, the, yeah. About the Obrador's first one, policies. Yeah, I'm not sure um, if, what exactly you're referring to. Yeah. Uh, or maybe I was some asking about uh, how does the members of the panel feel of regarding the policies of, of, of President Andrés Manuel López Obrador in, in Mexico regarding uh, his treatment of 
of Central American migrants and his plans to stop uh, to prevent to prevent the necessity of migration towards the, the United States. Uh, do you think uh, okay. they could work? Okay, no, okay, I, I, I'm sorry, because, yeah, first of all, you did ask that question, and I thought you were, you were referring to something else, which I knew I didn't understand, but now I think that you're in a zone where I can, you know, say something, maybe you guys want to say something, too. I mean, I, I do think that this is, um, this creates a situation where you could have a replication of some of the problems we've seen in other situations, um, the transit country, the third country, right? I mean, I think you... The situation where you could have something like the EU Jordan, you could have something like Turkey, it could be the outsourcing of border control and the outsourcing of, of all kinds of things, including um, lack of access to the asylum system. Um, and so that would be, that'd be one way to interpret it. I, my sense is, I, d I don't know, you know, really very much about sort of the transition to a new presidency in Mexico and what the politics of that are. I'm trying to figure out exactly um, what position, I mean, part of it is what position, what he can argue for, and what is, the, what is the scope of what he wants in these negotiations. I think he's in a position of certain degree of strength, um, but also in a situation of possibly a structural weakness. And so I think that this is a, you know, I think this is a pivotal moment, or a, a moment meaning like a period of six months or so, or a year, where I think um, it could, it, it could turn into something that's, that's very um, regressive or not. I mean, I, that, that's, that's kind of a, I don't know this future type of an answer, but I do think it's, it's exactly the right question. And I think it's the question that gets replicated if we were to, re if, if is all these countries are looking at other, you know, certainly transit states. If you want anything to that, I mean, it's, yeah. I mean, I just, I, it's hard for me to distinguish. I know it's distinguishable, and, it, and Hiroshi does it in his paper, but between what Australia does and what the United States is seeking to do um, in terms of um, pushing out um, the border and um, keeping people um, in contained places, um, whether through a third country, through another country, or um, through you know island detention camps, uh, which is what Australia um, maintains. I know it's more like it's more complex than that with regard to Mexico. Um, but it, again, just see, to, to, to me, again, what people on the ground, you know, the organizations and movement organizations and church organizations created a shelters, you know, on the route uh, through Mexico for caravans. I mean, that to me is what, you know, free passage, safe passage, safe from violence, safe from trafficking, um, safe from uh, susceptibility to cartels, like, that seems to me to, the res to be the responsibility of nation states, right, to protect people um, as, they, as they go through them, even if they don't have status, <laughs> the formal status in that country. And so that, uh, you know, the idea of a, I know this is the way it's going to go down, this is a negotiation between the Trump administration and AMLO with regard to, you know, um, and how, you know, how, how Mexico can take advantage of their, 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 their strategic position to get some concessions from Trump. Um, but I, it feels to me like there's something more foundational, uh, uh, you know, that needs to come into play beyond the power play between countries. But it's kind of okay, other questions? Yes. Um, I'm curious about how you will get all this uh, information about, um, about you in your book if the kind of, uh, if you make uh, interviews or you are looking for uh, another paper saying how will you uh, boil all this uh, information because I think this is very uh, complex, uh, how <laughs> many items that you are looking for and I'm really curious uh, how you will get <laughs> yeah, that's I think that's we're before we talk about it, we can click a few questions. Yeah, 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 yeah. Jake has his hand up over the left. Other questions? Yes. Um, this is for Samir, and maybe it's kind of a little uh, uh, detailed question. But uh, I'm interested about your framing of the sort of all labor groups, the National Quest Workers Alliance, Angelan, Rock, um, in relation to the traditional unions. Personally, I'm interested in this because I'm a poor union organizer, became a political scientist. 
feel like you, you do have a somewhat optimistic uh, perspective of this, which is that the alliance between these two are evidence of, I don't know, maybe the increasing creativity, relevance, wokeness of traditional unions. Um, I think you'd also see it in a different way, too, which it could be evidence of the uh, uh, the desperation of, lower, uh, of lowering the expectations of traditional unions um, in terms of being simply unable to organize many groups of the new economy, uh, such as domestic workers in traditional ways. Um, for all the heat that Fight for 15 has created, it still has not produced a comprehensive uh, uh, you know, contract, a, uh, a collective uh, bargaining agreement for fast food workers in the US. So I guess the question is, should we see this as, uh, as evidence of a resurgent labor movement, or should we see it as just more evidence of the continued decline? Other questions? Yes, Jake. Yes. Uh, I just wanted to add something to the uh, 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 Alberto. Alberto, yeah. Um, he, he said about Amarillo's policy in like, Mexico. Um, and what I find really interesting about it is that it seems to be, to me, to be very much, um, often we think about the transit country policy in terms of a world systems framework where the, you know, the, destination country is putting pressure on the transit country to kind of implement um, those sort of policies and I'm, I'm not an expert in like what's happening right now in Mexico uh, Mexican government but um, I find it interesting that it seems like the way it's described in the news is that it's Mexico's new government's own policy and the Washington's watching it with interest they're curious about how it might help or hurt their kind of objectives and so I think, because the way um, the panelists kind of responded to it, it kind of seems like it's this kind of world system framework, but I'm interested in you know, how you think about that, like countries have their own policies. I also think of, uh, when we're talking about development aid, like China's One Belt, One Road program, which is kind of like its own Marshall Plan in Africa, Latin America. And to the extent that you know, these aren't like, these transit countries aren't necessarily deferring to the metropolitan countries, but um, to deal with migration from the peripheral countries, but it's actually often their own autonomous policies, which may, as Hiroshi mentioned, have those problems or not. And it's just understanding that actually policy is actually becoming, emerging kind of indigenously from the transit countries that makes you think differently about it. Mm -hmm. Okay, let me respond to those. So how, how am I going to finish this? <laughs> <laughs> I'm not finishing it. You're finishing it. <laughs> I mean, the, the point of this project is to start a conversation, right? It's, a, it's a start a, um, it's to start a conversation about and get people to talk to each other and raise the questions that are the questions we're answering. And that's why I honestly don't know if this is teared down a liberal, a liberal nationalism or not. I mean, it kind of is and it kind of isn't, right? And if it's, but if that's not the way you take it, it's also a roadmap to try to figure out how to get something better. And so, you know, I, I mean, it's kind of a flip answer, but it's, it's also the honest one, which is that um, uh, I know that uh, even, even in the parts that I, I feel I know something about, like uh, part one, I mean, um, uh, Samir's comment about how, well, wait a minute, you're looking at this in a certain way, and you know, you're kind of, you know, not looking at these other social movements. I mean, that's absolutely right. In that sense, you should withdraw your stipulation to part one. Because it's because part one really only looks in a certain way. So I mean, I, this is this is part of the project here, and I think that a lot of this project is about sort of instigating conversations and research in multiple different disciplines and to get people to talk to each other. Because I'm also struck as I sort of think about this in different places around the world. Um, um, there was a um, uh, some of you may know the name or, or or even met him in the past. He's passed away. as a, a Myron Wiener, he's a political scientist, and he told me once, you can tell how the country feels about migration by who shows up at migration conferences. You know, he's basically complaining in the United States there are too many lawyers, uh, but that in um, but in in Germany there were it was demographers, and in Japan it's labor economists. Uh, and so I wanted to get that conversation going. So in that sense, I, I, I you know I'm I'm not going to finish this project in a way, but I do want to fill it out into a book form, and I do want it to be. So, and then what, uh, just as an authorial confession, one of the problems with this book is that it addresses things that I wish I knew more about. And so I'm trying to find the sweet spot where I say enough to make it sound like I know something about it, but not purport to be an expert on many <laughs> of these things. Now, that, that gets me actually something I wanted to say in relation to s the social movement um, question. Um, I actually realized, that, Samir, as you were saying this about social movements, um, that a lot of this is written as someone who has, 
taught a course called immigration law and taught a course called immigrants' rights. And I might have written it very differently if I taught a course called labor law. And that's your point, right? I mean, in other words, like, this is civil rights in a certain way because I've grown up in some sense in a certain movement um, and, and, and a, certain, a certain bunch of people who thought of themselves as the successors to, to the people who went to Mississippi in 1966, right? And, and there's a whole other movement. It raises this question, the, the third question here, about sort of efficacy and that kind of thing. And, you know, and, and, you know, it was interesting that, I mean, maybe you're too optimistic, right, in that sense. But, but I'm saying, but, but, but it, I also realize that that's the critique of part one as well. Um, one thing I want to say, um, um, and, and uh, you know, um, Jake, when you were talking about, um, I, I think part of the point of this project is to identify all the ways that the Mexico-U.S. negotiations could go um, and to kind of as if, I mean, I think about who's the audience for this project, and some of it's this room, and sort of like here's here's kind of, you know, an agenda you should you should sort of think about. But the other is to sort of say, well, if you were, rep you know, if you were if you were advising people in Mexican government, what would you tell them is going on? What are the precursors, and what are the dangers, and what are the mechanisms that who might want to see at the table, and why you might want them or not? That's that's kind of you know um, minimalist, but it's it's I think it's foundational. Um, in terms of um, administrative state, you know, so, I mean, if, can I give you another flip answer? It's sort <laughs> of like, so, I mean, when I wrote the book Immigration Outside the Law, there's different ways to think about what that book was about. But it, was, it was really about undocumented immigration, but it's really about is administrative discretion in immigration enforcement. And so there's way more to say about that and way more I didn't say. But this response is, is trying to figure out what else is there that we're, I'm worried about. And so I completely agree that that could, that could have you know, been um, a different, um, a different uh, piece of this project. And it also makes me realize that you know, it could be an um, elaboration on parts of part one that I don't get into. And if anything, it translates into part three in trying to think about how can we think of the rule of law in the context that used, that used to be in another book, my concern when it comes to local enforcement or, or internal enforcement inside the United States, how can we apply that same sensibility to a much more daunting challenge, which is to how to bring that regularity to, um, to trade and development, uh, and is that ultimately a doomed enterprise? You know, that's, that's a sort of set of things here. Okay. Any other questions, comments? Can I just respond on yes, the, please, the labor course, yes. uh, question? So um, I, 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 th I do think I'm um, over optimistic. I'm partly a, I'm a, I'm a clinical, clinical teacher, so I, I, I work in collaboration with a bunch of the groups that I named. Not, not a lot of them, but a few. And so um, I have a lawyer-client relationship <laughs> with them to some degree, and I believe in, in the group. So that colors my scholarship in a particular way. Um, However, I think one might objectively say a few things, which is one that um, the baseline is of uh, uh, organized labor in, in steep decline. Um, and what has managed to happen in the last 15 years is that the immigrant worker centers have very cleverly been managed to create alliances to redeploy extant union power, particularly in Washington, D.C., in ways that were really kind of unpredicted and really surprising, right? So for example, f on f for DACA and against comprehensive immigration reform, when that was going down in flames, um, against secure communities, right? These are things that were thought to be unwinnable fights at the grassroots and in Washington, D.C. And the c sort of creative alliances between immigrant worker centers um, who had the base uh, with union power in Washington, D.C. really created some wins there. So that's one thing I think this empirically happened. Two, that there are, there are increases in, in employment standards. So New York State increased their uh, minimum wage in particular sectors because of Fight for 15. So yes, there's no national contract that binds franchises um, by a certain terms, but there have been real significant moves and, uh, you know, in, in various jurisdictions. And now there's a bill to raise the minimum wage to $15 in, that's pending in, in the House and that likely would, you know, see passage in 2020 if there was a Democratic takeover. Um, and then, I, you know, I think that um, 
So yeah, that uh, and uh, the other thing you see is strike activity. Now again, I don't want to tie it all back to immigrant worker centers, right? <laughs> Teacher strikes is a phenomenon in and of itself, but you see a labor movement that appears to be have at least signs of life, um, and some of it I think is rooted in the collaborations and the new kinds of strategies and leadership fights and uh, reform efforts within 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 the movement, or you know both strengthened by the movement orgs and within the union. So that's my kind of optimistic take on what's happening in the labor sphere. You know, but the, oh. Sorry, do you mind if I, yeah, I kind of jump, so I've been out of community organizing and I worked for SEIU the last <laughs> thing that I did. And then I somehow ended up grad school, you know, and then I'm back. And I would say that when I was, that was 2002 when I burned out. In that time, it was really like, you didn't have destiny in your time, and there's no way that anybody, really people aren't really organizing the private sector, right? Except, with the exception of hotels, maybe, a little bit, but they cherry. And I would say right now, in terms of the civil rights and the kind of the, the, the inheritance, right? I mean, Martin Luther King, when he was assassinated, was, he was fighting for janitors, right? right. And so, and for the, I mean, not janitors, sanitation, sanitation workers. workers, excuse me, sanitation, we are, you know, I am a man. Um, and I think there's just, like, the, the, the base organizations that are civil rights organizations are really seeing economic, I mean, they're, I think economic justice has been part of that this whole time, right? right? And I think the forefront, you can think about not just kind of these fights of 15, but actually enforcement, like at the California like level mm -hmm. of kind of the enforcement things that are happening. It's like, there's like real, I don't know, maybe I'm also overly optimistic. I would like to hope that we, you know, um, that people have power when they organize. And, and I think there are signs of that. Do you want to have a last word? Well, I don't feel the last word. I mean, we have, have three more minutes. Okay, so I'll, 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 I'll yield the I mean, last two minutes to you guys. But, um, you know, one thing that, that, that the exchange about, about, you know, really starting with what you're saying about social movements, but also talking about labor organizing makes me kind of think about is that um, in many respects, um, this particular paper and this particular project is written by a lawyer in the following sense. Um, I think if you look at uh, the arguments that are made um, in court, uh, if, you look, if you look at the mission statements and sort of the things that, that frame a lot of advocacy organizations that are kind of lawyer heavy, uh, if you look then how that translates into everything from interviews on television to congressional testimony, then you would think of this, you would think of this, you would stipulate the civil rights framing because, because it's all about Plyler versus Doe and access and whether it's a constitutional right to go to school and stuff like that. But if you were to listen to what's going, people are saying in the streets, that might be quite different. And so I want to admit that this is, and this gets back to the information question really is like, you know, I'm looking at information, I'm doing, I'm doing what, you know, what law professors do is to read legal documents uh, and I'm not interviewing people in the same sort of way and I think that skews, I have to admit, sort of um, my framing of what it is that is going on. Uh, and the only defense of that really is that I'm writing about law and, the, and what law can do and that law should capture more of the social movement discourse than the traditional civil rights discourse. The other thing I'll say real quickly is that part of this is, is freighted with this question of, you know, we have a problem. Immigration um, is, is, is somewhere, uh, somewhere in the universe and then, then there's a lot of this comes down to, does, is, immigra is, immigra is immigration supposed to solve all problems? That's, that's part of the issue, right? I mean, par part of the pushback against immigration-related proposals uh, or even um, research agendas is, well, that's not going to work because of some other problem. And, and it, you know, it's, it's, it, I just feel like somehow um, migration and migration responses are freighted with a lot of responsibility that is unrealistic. Um, but that, was more than, um, that was more than one minute, but less than three. Okay, terrific. <laughs> so I want to thank Hiroshi for a great uh, okay. paper.